The views and opinions expressed on Reasonably Speaking are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of the American Law Institute or the speakers' organizations. The content presented in this broadcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered legal advice. Please be advised that episodes of Reasonably Speaking explore complex and often sensitive legal topics and may contain mature content. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the American Law Institute's podcast, Reasonably Speaking. Today, our panel is going to discuss the treatment of children in two distinct areas of law, child welfare and juvenile justice. This program was originally recorded as a CLE program in partnership with ALI CLE. Our first panelist is Kristen Henning. Kristen is a professor at the Georgetown Law Center, where she also serves as special advisor to the Dean on Community and Justice and director of the Juvenile Justice Clinic and Initiative. Previously, she was with the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia, where she served for several years as the lead attorney for the juvenile unit. She's been active in local, regional, and national juvenile justice reform and has served as an expert consultant to a number of state and federal agencies, including the U.S. Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division. Our second panelist is Claire Huntington of Fordham University School of Law. Claire is an expert in the fields of family law and poverty law. She has published widely on the intersection of these two fields, including in her book, Failure to Flourish, How Law Undermines Family Relationships. Prior to Fordham, Claire was an attorney advisor in the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel. She currently serves as associate reporter on the Restatement of Children and the Law. The third panelist on the program is Marsha Levick, co-founder of the Juvenile Law Center. Throughout her legal career, Marsha has been an advocate for children's and women's rights and is nationally recognized expert in juvenile law. Marsha oversees Juvenile Law Center's litigation and appellate docket. She has successfully litigated challenges to unlawful and harmful laws, policies, and practices on behalf of children in both the juvenile justice and child welfare systems. Today's program is moderated by Elizabeth Scott of Columbia Law School. Elizabeth is a leading authority on juvenile justice, having written extensively on juvenile crime and delinquency, adolescent decision-making, and marriage, divorce, cohabitation, and child custody. In her research, she takes an interdisciplinary approach, applying behavioral economics, social science research, and developmental theory to family and juvenile law and policy issues. She is the reporter for the American Law Institute's Restatement of Children and the Law. Elizabeth will now begin the program. Uh, I think everyone understands that the most vulnerable communities in our society have experienced the harmful impact of COVID directly. And the um, children in the justice system and children and families in the child welfare system uh, are among the most vulnerable uh, communities. And what we want to look at today is is uh, is the impact of this pandemic on uh, 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 on uh, children in in the justice system and the child welfare system, on the operation of those systems, and on uh, the role of uh, the role of lawyers as they try to represent children to protect their legal rights and and to keep them safe during during this uh, this. You know, extraordinary uh, time, and so we thought we would begin by uh, by uh, just uh, sort of an overview of looking at the big picture and how the operation of these uh, two systems have 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 changed during the time of COVID, and then and then to uh, to look uh, uh, more closely at some of the. Uh, some of the, some of the effects, some of the consequences of uh, for children, for lawyers, and for the system itself of 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 uh, operating of uh, and existing during during this time. So, um, Claire, uh, uh, could you could you say a little bit about uh, the uh, the impact you know, of COVID generally on the operation of the child welfare system? Uh, and sort of how things have changed since uh, since February or March of 2020. Sure, thanks, Buffy. Um, well, I think the first place to start is what the child welfare system should be doing absent a pandemic. 
Um, and we really lay this out quite clearly in the restatement that the goal of the child welfare system is to promote child well-being. And that the way to do that in the vast majority of cases is to keep children at home, but to give families the support that they need to deal with the underlying issues that led to the family's involvement in the child welfare system. So usually what this looks like is the family is identified uh, for almost always neglect, not abuse. And I can say more about that in, in, in a few minutes. Um, and they're brought into the system. And then the question is, how does the system respond? And really one of the main obligations, and we talk about this um, in section 2.31, is for the state to provide services to the family to keep the child safely at home, to ensure the child is safe, but to try and keep the child at home and not, um, and, and not lead to the removal of the child. Um, if the child is removed, then the obligation of the state is to try to reunify the family, to bring the family back together after the child has been in foster care. And one of the key parts of that is to maintain contact between parents and children. This is important for children of any age, but is particularly important for children of a very young age. So the two pieces of that, providing services to keep families together and children safely at home and ensure contact between children who are in foster care, um, but between children who are in foster care and their parents, both of those have been profoundly affected by, by COVID. Um, so on the front end, ensuring that we are getting services to families that need it, um, this is harder, both because uh, it's certainly the reports of child abuse and neglect um, have gone down, and that's because children are not in the public spaces, primarily schools, where they ordinarily are, and reports um, come in. Um, but uh, but so, so, so fewer cases are coming in, which in some ways is a good thing because there are lots of, and we'll talk about this more today, lots of ways in which the child welfare system often does not in fact improve child well-being. So maybe it's better to keep the state out, um, but it is also a way to ensure that family get, families get services. So if families aren't being identified as needing services, um, then, then the child welfare system isn't providing those. So that's one way in which it's affecting it is not identifying the families that need services and then providing those services. But then, and this is where we really are seeing a devastating impact is for children who have already before the pandemic um, been removed from their homes and are living in foster care, the ability for the parents and children to see each other has, uh, is just extraordinarily difficult right now. Um, and I can talk more about that, but, but just as a, as, as a basic yeah. overview, those, that's the main problem. Those are the two main problems. Thanks, Claire. And and uh, Marcia, can you say something about the the overall impact on the operation of juvenile justice and the juvenile justice system? Sure. And I think I'll really start in the way that Claire did, which is to also talk about the purposes, the overarching purposes of the juvenile justice system. And to the extent that children are found culpable for delinquent activity. Um, we expect the system to provide programming and rehabilitation services to these youth at the same time that we're holding them accountable. And obviously, whether children are in juvenile correctional facilities or residential programs or whether they are home in their communities, the pandemic has significantly cramped the ability um, of services to uh, continue to maintain contact with these kids. So whether it is in-person programming in juvenile correctional facilities, in-person school programs, uh, mental health counseling for youth in the community, the ability to continue to receive probation services, for example, other kinds of community resources that traditionally would require in-person contact, all of that has essentially been, uh, if not completely shut down, uh, significantly shut down, limited, altered, um, by a consequence of the pandemic. And the consequence of that is that uh, youth are, are being retained in a system that is largely incapable of meeting the function and purposes for which it was set up. It's also important to recognize, of course, that not only are, are the facilities, a sort of end part of the juvenile justice system, struggling uh, to maintain the, the functions and services, but the entry part of the system, which I know Chris will talk about, 
is suffering in its own way um, for many months when the pandemic really uh, shut down much of what was happening across the country. Courts shut down. Uh, and so we the the traditional sort of beginning of the pipeline for children to come into the system, uh, courts were not operating. On the one hand, that was a good thing because it meant that youth were not being brought into the system, but there was also, uh, frankly, an inability to get youth out of the system. To the extent that courts weren't operating, uh, agencies were hampered in their ability to conduct business in the usual fashion. It meant that it was more difficult to, uh, to release children from facilities who either were ready to be released, youth who were medically vulnerable, um, who needed to uh, be placed in a setting that would place them at less risk. All of the systems, uh, as I said, if they didn't completely shut down, they came close to shutting down and it just made it incredibly challenging uh, to frankly sort of run business as usual. It was anything but business as usual. So, Chris, that's, uh, can I turn to you and ask you to, to uh, tell us a bit about your role as a lawyer representing youth and trying to protect their legal rights as they face delinquency adjudications and some of the challenges that, uh, uh, that you faced in this time of COVID? Sure. And I'll, you know, pick up right where Marsha left off. I mean, that's exactly right. At the beginning of the pandemic, I mean, many courts all but shut down and became dysfunctional, um, thereby depriving kids of any semblance of, of due process. Um, but even since then, even in the weeks that followed, um, I think we have seen due process rights compromised um, even more than they were uh, before the pandemic. Um, so just to give a few examples, I think access to counsel um, to children in detention facilities, for example, um, before hearings was difficult before the pandemic. And I think the pandemic uh, provides or has provided many systems with a ready excuse to make that even more difficult. So either denying uh, attorneys access to their clients altogether in facilities, um, uh, limiting or denying phone calls uh, to young people, listening in even more on phone calls. Many of the facilities aren't equipped uh, with the technology for Zoom hearings. Um, and then in hearings, you know, access to counsel um, for those courthouses that shifted to virtual hearings. Um, access to counsel became even more complicated. Um, we as lawyers can't pass our clients' notes. Um, we um, have difficulty getting our clients, as we know, many adolescents and many children have a hard time paying attention. Um, and it's even harder uh, with the limited technology that many of our clients have, um, both to understand what's being said um, and then to engage uh, appropriately um, when they're asked to during the court hearings and just to, to pay attention and to stay focused. Um, and, you know, so these are some of the, for example, I mean, these are some of the challenges that lawyers have had to take on, um, filing motions to compel the city uh, to provide access to, to, to uh, at, provide access to youth in facilities, um, in, uh, demanding that cities invest in the technology. Actually, many lawyers have been creative and have gotten law firms to donate um, laptops to various facilities to ensure um, that kids can communicate with their counsel. Um, uh, you know, Things like that, partnering with civil rights lawyers to challenge impediments to access to counsel. So that's just one area. I mean, a couple of other areas we're talking about are conf confrontation clause issues. Um, um, you know, young people, the accused, adults and children have a right to be physically present when witnesses are testifying against them. Um, and so defense counsel are, are in this very difficult um, uh, position of trying to, to decide whether or not to object to virtual hearings altogether um, or to allow them to proceed uh, so that we don't find ourselves in the conundrum that Marsha talked about, which is that kids get stuck um, because there aren't hearings and that nobody is moving the kids. Um, but but, you know, using the law, using, you know, Maryland versus Craig and some of the other constitutional cases to argue um, that virtual hearings or virtual uh, arraignments aren't adequate 
um, uh, to preserve the confrontation rights. Um, and that could go on from there. Speedy trial issues, um, decision making without clients' presence or input, um, the right to present a defense, access to discovery, um, the inability of the government to, to, to complete forensic testing. These are just some of the many, many challenges that Defense Council has had to deal with on the, the front end of the system. Thanks, Chris. This, you know, the challenges seem seem pretty extraordinary, and and I know that that you and your students are are uh, doing a great under very uh, difficult uh, circumstances. Uh, so, uh, so uh, Claire, I know you don't don't do direct representation in the child welfare system, but but uh, do you think that those decisions when when uh, the either the investigation or the role of lawyers in um, uh, uh, in those cases when the state is seeking to remove a child are uh, are, are severely or, or substantially affected by by the uh, the uh, the situation we're in with covid um, you know, I really can't speak to what's uh, to, to to what the lawyers are seeing because, as you say, that those are not the cases that I'm doing on the ground. But I can talk more generally um, about what, again, what the state is supposed to be doing when it is um, when when it finds uh, you know it's when it substantiates a case of either abuse or neglect. And here, this seems like a really important point to talk about what kinds of cases come into the child welfare system. They are overwhelmingly cases of poverty related neglect, right? So if we look at the um, federal statistics from FY 2019, which are the most recent that we have, which are pre-pandemic only, and I don't say that lightly because these can be difficult cases, but only 13% of the kids who came into foster care, so who were removed from their homes, but who came into foster care, um, were, came in as a result of physical abuse. The vast majority, and really only 4% were as a result of sexual abuse. So the vast majority fall under this umbrella of neglect um, and there's specific things. So it can be, you know, uh, substance abuse was 34% of the cases, um, you know, inadequate parental supervision, 14%, housing, 10%. These are all issues that are really driven by poverty, right? So families across the income spectrum struggle with substance abuse, mental illness, the stress of parenting, um, but it's for low-income families uh, that these problems, um, that, 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 that the poverty really exacerbates, again, the problems that, that, that many, many families um, face. And so the question is, what do we do with this poverty-related neglect? Now, many people will say, well, far too often what we don't have is a much more robust system that would prevent these problems to begin with and support families in all kinds of ways. Um, but the way the child welfare system works is that we wait until families really are right on the brink because they're really, you know, these problems have pushed the families, uh, you know, again, exacerbated by poverty, really push the problems and, and have placed the children in some kind of danger, typically from neglect. And then the state comes in and tries to assess what should be done. And almost always the, the first step, unless there's a really severe and kind of imminent harm to the child, but the first step is to try to provide services to the child at home um, and, and to, the parent, to the parents and the child at home. And that's, again, what is really severely impacted uh, by COVID is the ability to visit with families, to identify their needs. And then also, as Marcia was saying before, to actually then get the services, right? If a, fa if a parent needs substance abuse, if a family needs to be able to change housing, if, a you know, if, 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 if they, the family needs childcare or other kinds of supervision, um, you know, so, you know help, help supervising children, um, all of those services are so much harder to provide um, during the pandemic. And the truth is we don't really know yet what's happening. You know, you hear reports that there is a spike um, in, 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 act, in the actual rate of child maltreatment. Others say we don't know, um, you know, and, and this will, we will find out, I'm sure, more over time. Um, but right now what we do know is that in many states, the reports of, um, of neglect and abuse have gone down. But again, that's partly because children are not, children may be seeing doctors, but probably less so than, than ordinarily, but they have not largely been in schools, which is one of the uh, main sources of, of, of referrals. 
Um, so we don't actually know what the child maltreatment rate is. Um, and even again, without the pandemic, it's hard to know what the actual child maltreatment rate is. And certainly the child welfare system doesn't catch all cases. Um, but, but right now we know um, we're not providing services to the families who need them. One of, one of the um, unknown, another unknown um, um, fact is, is that what kinds of decisions judges are making about removal when kids actually uh, do come, when families do come to court and the state is seeking to remove uh, remove them. There is you know, sort of a speculation that that courts should be um, less willing to remove children in a time of COVID, that they should leave, leave those um, uh, to put the child in a new environment. It's just to create a risk that didn't have to exist. But, but also it's the case that, the, that poor communities have, have suffered, as, as I said at the outset, have suffered from COVID more than, uh, uh, more than other communities and uh, children of color and, and, and uh, children in, uh, in poor families have, 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 been, uh, have lived in environments that have been subject to, to uh, uh, to COVID to a greater extent than, than other communities. So what some, some, I know some uh, lawyers who work in the system are worried that, um, uh, that courts might see removing children from, you know, from families where there are a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of family members living together in an environment that has a lot of COVID is, um, uh, might be better for the child, which which seems like a like a very another negative impact of uh, uh, of COVID. So I mean that would certainly be deeply problematic, especially given the evidence that we have that children, albeit there are a very small number of children who really have devastating impact, including you know some some children dying, but by and large, children are not affected by this. Um, that's by this true. Disease, yeah. Right. So it's really not the children who are at risk, it's their parents and really their grandparents who, who are at risk. But what we do know for sure is that children are at terrible risk of poor outcomes when they're removed from their families, right? That the simple act of removing a child from their home can have devastating and long-term impact on a child, which is not to say that it shouldn't be done in a small number of cases, right? There are times when it is clearly worse for a child to remain at home than it is to be removed. Um, but really, that should be saved for only a very small number of cases where it's absolutely uh, critical to protect the safety of the child. And much more often, it's, um, it's better for the child to be able to provide services um, to, the, to, the, to the family. Um, and so, the I, Chris, I, I'm, uh, I'm curious as to whether, uh, whether you have seen judges, if, uh, if cases do come before a judge, are judges more likely not to put kids in detention because putting putting a, a youth into that kind of congregate setting is clearly increasing the danger of COVID. Is that has uh, have detention placements gone down in uh, in this time? So you know, I think the answer to that depends on where you are in the country. Um, that being said, I would say, based on certainly my experience in the District of Columbia and my communication with with defenders in other jurisdictions, that by and large, um, that COVID has given the country an opportunity to realize that we can reduce the number of children in. Uh, uh, in detention facilities without radically um, compromising public safety. And so um, amid fears of liability um, within de detention facilities, and as a result of some legitimate uh, compassion and humanity for young people, we have seen some reduction in detention. So children, um, uh, have been, I think judges across the country have been more inclined to release children uh, pending trial at the time of arrest. Uh, they've been more inclined to release children who have been previously uh, placed in detention facilities. So when detention, uh, so when defense counsel are, are vigorous um, about filing motions to reduce detention, we are getting 
of a better response from the judges. Um, we have been successful in getting uh, some children removed from long-term residential placement facilities. Um, we've had some success in getting children who are sent away out of state uh, to return um, uh, to the local jurisdiction where they can be closer to their families in this moment. So, I mean, there is some, um, I think there is some movement um, uh, in this. I think the, so notwithstanding the fact that by and large children are better, uh, are, are doing better um, in response to COVID in, in terms of medically, um, the reality is there are enough stories of children in detention facilities um, uh, getting COVID, um, transmitting COVID to staff, staff uh, dying as a result. And so there's just been some, some movement. And I think that, I mean, I know we'll come back and we'll talk about lessons, um, but the real lesson, um, the lesson is out whether you know crime rates will stay down. But if our goal um, in this country is to have the least restrictive, um, the least intrusive uh, juvenile legal system that keeps our country safe, I think COVID has taught us that there are alternative ways um, to, to make that happen. Thanks, Chris. And that, uh, Marcia, this seems like a good time to turn to you and the, and the litigation that you've been involved uh, in, in sort of with kids who are already in the system, who are in you know, crowded facilities that, uh, and at risk of COVID and, and um, that your work to try to get them released. Could you, could you talk to us a little about that and about the kinds of arguments you've made and the, the success or, or lack of success that you've had in that Yep, absolutely. Um, before I do that, and I do want to answer that question, I just want to pick up on some of Claire's comments, um, because I wanted to just make sure that we also talk about older youth. Mm -hmm. um, I think when we think about the child welfare system, we often think about uh, younger children who are often victims of abuse and neglect and concerned about where they are within the system, in foster families, whether they can stay in their own homes, but there is a whole uh, cohort of older teens, many of whom, thankfully, as a result of recent federal legislation, have not actually had to age out of the system at 18, but have had opportunities to stay in care. Unfortunately, some of the rules and requirements that allow them to stay in care actually provide that they should be involved in some type of educational or employment program. In the times of COVID, that has proven to be incredibly difficult. Educational programs are not available. They're not accessible. Many older youth, many youth who are in the system who have the opportunity to get employment, uh, some of them are working in the service sector, whether it's restaurants or other aspects of the service sector that have been the hardest hit by COVID. And so suddenly, what seemed like a perfectly reasonable set of criteria to allow for youth after they turn 18 to continue to receive services and supports from our child welfare system, those opportunities are not available. And that has created a crisis for many of those youth who are facing real strains in terms of their housing opportunities. Those housing complications have led more of these youth into homelessness. Uh, the employment situation has forced many of them into an unemployment situation, which is increasing their financial stress and their financial vulnerabilities. Um, so this is just another cohort that is experiencing a very specific set of challenges as a consequence of COVID. And I wanna make sure that we th we're talking about them as well. With respect to the litigation that we have been involved in, um, let me share some numbers. Uh, and I wanna give a shout out to the Sentencing Project who is Josh Robner at the Sentencing Project has really been tracking um, how COVID is affecting, literally, um, how it is spreading through juvenile correctional facilities across the country. Latest numbers, um, I'm sure these numbers, uh, they change every day, but roughly about 1,800 youth across the country who are in facilities, congregate care facilities in the juvenile justice system have been infected with COVID. 2,500 staff um, have been infected. Uh, we have had some staff deaths, no deaths among children, and that's great news. Um, any deaths within the system is quite disturbing. Um, so this system is not immune. Um, and I, I know that, uh, and we've said it here today, it is true that youth are less vulnerable 
to COVID and to the risks of contracting COVID, but they do, they do become infected. Um, and it is, of course, also a known fact that any type of congregate care facility, whether it is a juvenile setting, a nursing home, a prison, a group home, are going to increase the risks that the individuals who are leaving and living in these facilities become infected. And so really because of that increased risk, we at Juvenile Law Center and colleagues across the country have also tried in addition to the kind of work that Chris is doing in the courtroom, um, day in and day out, case by case to save children um, from the ravages of COVID. We've also tried in a handful of locations to see whether or not we could get systemic relief for youth in these juvenile justice facilities. This is mirrored to a large extent the efforts that have been done in the adult criminal population as well, where have been, there has been lots of litigation uh, filed against both federal and state prisons. So I can talk about litigation um, in five states that we have either been directly or indirectly through consultation and support been involved in, uh, Louisiana, Pennsylvania, Maryland, New York, and in Los Angeles County. And honestly, it's uh, not a great picture. Uh, I think that the federal and state courts have been reluctant to, uh, to find that the risks posed to this young population in congregate care facilities is one that rises to a constitutional violation or is one that can be fixed by a constitutional remedy. Um, so what, what we have seen in these cases is that largely these cases are asserting that to continue to house children in settings that we know place them at greater risk um, is a violation of both their rights to be free from cruel and unusual punishment and their rights to due process. Um, and the due process arguments, which is really both procedural and substantive, is coming out of what I said earlier. The juvenile justice system was created um, and continues to purport to be about providing rehabilitation and services to children. Yes, it's about holding them accountable, but it also does it in a way that ensures that they can come back into their communities um, and be productive members of those communities. When COVID shuts down those opportunities, when it makes it impossible to deliver schooling, education, rehabilitation, counseling, mental health services, it is appropriate, I think for us as lawyers, to question how is it that we continue, can continue to retain youth in these facilities. The courts, um, as I said, have not embraced these constitutional arguments. And I think that the way that I would sum up the way that the courts have responded is that they have um, to a large extent rejected straight up constitutional challenges to the placement of youth in these facilities. And then either suggested indirectly uh, or in a softer manner that it really would be a good idea if judges would examine uh, and consider COVID in making both release and confinement decisions. Um, and so we're seeing that judges, local judges, juvenile court judges in the jurisdictions that I cited, for example, or executive agencies that are running um, juvenile justice systems in some of these jurisdictions are on their own sort of getting this indirect message. You really do need to take COVID into account, but we as a court may not order you to actually do anything. And so we're seeing reductions in population. We're seeing changes in programming. So I know Chris talked about, um, you know, obviously things just really shut down in March and April. Youth weren't being arrested. Courts were completely dysfunctional. Courts weren't really open for business. The numbers that I've seen, um, I think on average prior to March and April, we might have been seeing around 200 kids a day across the country coming into placement. That number uh, is now down to about 100 a day. That's dramatic. We've cut that number by 50%. Um, and I am sure that it is a consequence of three things. Uh, fewer arrests, we know that. Uh, a consequence of the day-to-day -day work of Chris and her colleagues who now are back in court and who are making arguments against placement. Um, and this, uh, as I said, kind of indirect urging, um, indirect suggestion to judges around the country, even if we can't order you to do this, we think it would be a good idea if you would do this. Um, and so in Pennsylvania, for example, we sought direct relief from the Pennsylvania Supreme Court 
asking them to essentially order that juvenile court judges across the state uh, explicitly take COVID into account and to begin to depopulate juvenile correctional facilities. The, our Pennsylvania Supreme Court said no to that specific ask and then said, but we really urge you all to do this. And so we have seen the numbers in Pennsylvania drop by anywhere between 25 and 30 percent of incarcerated youth. That's a good number. It should be lower. Um, but we have seen that happen without actually a formal directive from the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. The exact same thing happened in Maryland. Advocates in Maryland sought a re specific order from the Maryland Court of Appeals uh, to reduce populations and raising the kinds of constitutional claims that I have identified. Maryland Supreme Court said no. I'm sorry, the Court of Appeals said no. Um, but then three days later, the court, the justices of the court issued a kind of general directive pointing out the risks of COVID and encouraging uh, juvenile court judges to take it into account and to begin to try to depopulate facilities. And their residential numbers have gone down in the justice system by somewhere around 30 or 40 percent. Again, a kind of indirect but very positive outcome. In, in Louisiana, uh, we brought litigation in federal court, uh, sought a TRO, raising the same kinds of due process and Eighth Amendment claims. A uh, federal judge denied our temporary restraining order. And I think um, what I want to point out here, which I think is important to this conversation uh, that we're seeing in uh, really jurisdictions across the country, when I talked about this reluctance to really embrace this as a constitutional problem, there's also a, a willingness to say, you know, they're doing the best they can, right? Which, which is interesting because this, these are challenging times for everyone. We understand staff are affected, staff are becoming infected. We appreciate the challenges of even running public schools in this environment. Um, so, so there is a, a reluctance on the part of courts, I think, to hold systems accountable for something that is beyond their control, which is COVID, um, at the same time that that reluctance, of course, places children in jeopardy. So in Louisiana, the federal judge denied the temporary restraining order, but at the same time has now encouraged the parties to enter into a settlement. And the, the agency that runs the facilities in Louisiana has indeed brought in-person programming back into the facility. They now have in-person schooling back into the facilities. They have begun to utilize their fur furlough program more aggressively to begin to release kids. So again, this sort of indirect response um, to direct, direct ask for specific relief. Um, I just want to talk about the Los Angeles County case because I think it, it highlights something else that um, Buffy, you alluded to in your, in your comments just a few minutes ago. Similar uh, action brought in LA County, different legal remedy. Uh, the advocates there sought a writ of mandamus to really compel the facilities in Los Angeles County to release youth. And the court denied that writ of mandamus. And I think one of the things that disturbed all of us in the field is that the court in denying that alluded to the fact that he wasn't really so convinced that kids would be safer in their home communities and in their homes than they were in publicly run facilities. And all of us read that as a very racist trope, that it was a, a that, that classic view that Kids aren't safe. Kids of color aren't safe in communities of color. Um, you, you mentioned this as well, Buffy, as I said in, in your remarks just a few minutes ago. And deeply disturbing, we had a little bit of this as well in our Louisiana decision where the federal judge also said, we don't, you know, the plaintiffs have asked for kids to go home on furloughs, but we don't really know anything about uh, what their home situation is, what their family environment is like, and whether or not that will in fact be a safer environment. We can't make those, we shouldn't make the assumptions that they're not. Um, and we shouldn't be raising questions about the ability of these families in these communities uh, to keep their families and to keep their kids safe. Uh, so it has been, um, it has been frustrating. I, I think to Chris's point, we, the numbers are down and I know we're gonna talk about some of lessons learned um, and observations that we're all making at this time uh, in both the justice and the child welfare systems. As, as a litigator, it is frustrating to me that the courts are unwilling to recognize the urgency of the moment and to uh, recognize that our constitution can provide remedies to these kinds of urgent moments that place youth at risk. 
Um, but we are nevertheless seeing these kinds of, as I say, sort of indirect reductions in incarceration and placement. So, so courts are not ordering, but nudging. They, they are. No, that is exactly in the right, right. In the right yes. direction. I want to return a in, a, in, a, in, a, in a couple minutes to the issue of the relationship between COVID and, and race or the response to COVID and race. But, but first to just, just say a few words about kids who are in foster care, because Claire, Claire mentioned uh, earlier that, um, uh, that the, the state's um, first priority is to keep children and their families and to provide services needed and that that ability to provide services is disrupted uh, by COVID. But when kids are removed from their families and placed in cost foster care, COVID in the same way has disrupted the provision of services that might allow children to return to their families. And so, uh, and so uh, what, what's happened in uh, uh, in in some jurisdictions, is that that few services are provided, uh, therapeutic services, services uh, to uh, to parents to allow them to reduce uh, to resume custody, uh, and uh, uh, and and foster care plans have not been subject to review. There, uh, uh, the court is uh, in in most states is supposed to review foster care plans on a regular basis to see if the child it, uh, can be returned to uh, the parents. And in the time of COVID, that's just not happening uh, and certainly not happening with the regularity that it should be happening. Uh, the other uh, issue that has um, has uh, has arisen uh, in, during COVID, as Claire mentioned, is uh, is uh, family visitation. Uh, and um, for uh, quite a while in, in, uh, in March and April and into the spring, parents were unable to see their children at all uh, and very unsatisfactory um, uh, remote virtual visits uh, had to be a substitute. Uh, in some jurisdictions have returned to in-person visitation by parents, uh, but that also has been somewhat controversial with, with some advocates arguing that, uh, that the return, uh, that visitation by parents is, uh, may introduce COVID into the foster, foster home. And it's, um, you know, I spoke with one advocate a couple of weeks ago who's, who, who said that, that he was, you know, in a small group of, uh, of child advocates who was worried about visitation. Most child advocates, I think, and I'm, I, I would imagine Claire shares this view, think that visitation and maintaining that bond between parents and, and children is so important that the risks are, are worth taking uh, even, um, uh, even during this time. And especially as Claire suggested, uh, when um, you know, we uh, the statistics on on children getting COVID uh, are uh, suggest that it the risk is uh, 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 is much uh, is much lower. So it's you know you know the, the both of these systems have been have been very much uh, uh, disrupted, and the, the sort of the underlying goals of child welfare uh, uh, system have 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 really been impacted uh, by uh, uh, by COVID. I want to return to the issue that uh, that Marcia raised, and, and that is the intersection of COVID and race, and the extent to which uh, to which the response to COVID in in these two systems. Is uh, is tainted by by race, and uh, Marcia described the Los Angeles um, uh, uh, case, and and it sort of represents what I spoke of earlier: the uh, concern that these children are living in dangerous communities, children of color, and therefore it's better for them not to be 
with their families in their communities. And I wonder, Chris, if you could say say more about the way you uh, you see race as uh, as as you know, sort of important and affecting the response to COVID. Yeah, I mean, the race question is critical. Um, I mean, we all know that COVID has had a um, drastic, drastically disproportionate impact on people of color, period, separate and apart from their involvement in the, the juvenile criminal legal systems and the child welfare systems. Um, but um, I mean, Marsha is exactly right. I mean, not only are we seeing a persistence in racial disparity and maybe even an increase in racial disparity um, as a result of these deeply ingrained attitudes um, about Black children and Black uh, families and, and the presumption that Black families aren't able to supervise their children, um, and particularly in a moment of crisis, that they um, aren't able uh, to provide uh, adequate care um, and supervision when children aren't in school um, and the like, instead of understanding and recognizing the resilience of communities of color that call upon uh, extended families, right, um, to provide those, those resources and support. So there's deeply ingrained uh, presumptions about uh, uh, motherhood and fatherhood in, in Black communities that I think is having a, a significant effect. Also the deeply ingrained attitudes and perceptions about uh, Black children as being dangerous um, has not gone away um, in the midst of, 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 of COVID. Um, and I think that uh, it is probably uh, given life and given fodder, given that many children are indeed, uh, it, poor children are often find themselves outside um, maybe during school hours because school is virtual and they don't have access to the technology or because of poverty, their uh, apartments are tight and cramped. And so they go outside for air. Um, and I say all of that to say that I fear that there has been an increase of police contact um, with young uh, uh, children of color and particularly young black uh, children in places like Washington, DC um, and uh, Latinx children um, in jurisdictions where the Latinx population is higher. And so one of the things that I wanna highlight for us is that I think although this, uh, this CLE is about COVID, we cannot forget that the pandemic started um, or coincided or, uh, or let me put it this way, that George Floyd <laughs> was killed <laughs> while, uh, while we are in the middle of a pandemic. And it is impossible, I think, to disentangle um, those two realities um, as we, we think about the impact of, of, of policing um, and COVID on, on children of color. So I have been thinking a lot about the psychological trauma that uh, Black children in particular are experiencing in this moment. And what does it mean um, to be stopped and frisked um, in the midst of COVID, right? So the, you know, a stop and frisk is traumatic in and of itself, particularly in heavily surveilled uh, communities of color. But now, you know, with an, a potential increase uh, justifications or potential justifications for police officers to stop young children who are outside without a mask or who are in violation of social distancing rules. Um, and so that um, uh, you've got police officers now uh, stopping and frisking black children with gloves on and masks on in ways that enhance the very dehumanizing nature of, of, of what is already uh, a very dehumanizing experience. And so I just think it's really important for us to, uh, to think about what that looks like and to think about how um, our systems, I would argue both the juvenile legal system and the child welfare system are, are uh, woefully inadequate to account for um, and respond to the, the trauma. Um, that comes from system involvement in and of itself, but that um, comes from racial trauma um, that is very much intertwined with, with systems involvement. Um, we've got children um, who are still, the, the children who are still in detention um, are in detention with reduced staff, um, reduced access to mental health, reduced access to programming, reduced access to support, reduced access, access to their families, denied family visits, 
um, in, in the midst of COVID. And so they're dealing with what they see on television and what they experience in their community as racial trauma. And, uh, and we are not uh, we're not equipped. The systems are not equipped to deal with that. So I, I, I really appreciate us elevating um, the race uh, question in this in this moment and and thinking about what we as advocates can do systemically and in individual uh, uh, um, cases um, to address that and to make the system less traumatic than it already is. If I could jump in as well and talk a bit about the okay. child welfare system, there is without a doubt any detrimental impact uh, that the child welfare system feels, uh, you know, and experiences is going to be felt that much more so by Black and Native American children. So those are the two groups of children who are disproportionately, in extraordinary numbers, disproportionately represented in the child welfare system. And then once they are in the system, have disparate outcomes less likely to return home, less likely to be adopted, more likely to age out, bringing bring, bring back to what Marsha was talking about before. Um, and so pre-pandemic, uh, we had this and, and have had really since the inception of the child welfare system, um, an extraordinary problem with the over-representation again of black and native American children um, in, the, in the child welfare system and have made efforts. So the Indian Child Welfare Act is an effort to try and preserve Native American families. There've been efforts made to try to address the racial disproportionality for black families. Um, some progress made on the disparate outcomes for black children, but really not much progress made on the, on the disproportionality. Um, and I just wanna pick up on something that Chris said, which is, it comes back to this point of whose parenthood do we value, right? Who do we see as a good mother or a good father? Um, and, you know, and, and, and then to tie this also to what Buffy was talking about with visitation, right? So that is without a doubt, one of the um, most devastating impacts for, for, of COVID is for children in foster care who are not able to see the parents and the parents are not able to see the children. So the actual in-person visitation just plummeted. Um, and the virtual visitation was also problematic. But what I want to underscore is that the most the, the, that the children in foster care tend to be very young, right? So the highest percentage of kids entering foster care in FY 2019 was, was under the age of one. Nearly 20% of the children who entered foster care were infants. And so you can't do a Zoom visit with an infant, right? And that critical bonding that happens between parents and children during those very early years um, is just being lost. And this is being disproportionately felt by Black and Native American families. I, I would also just add here that um, I think it's really important to uh, recognize yet again uh, the othering of Black and Brown communities and Black and Brown children. And, you know, as, as someone who approaches this work by trying to achieve systemic reform, um, these facilities are largely populated by black and brown youth. And, and I cannot help but feel after decades of doing this work uh, that they remain a population that is too easy to discard, um, a population that is too easy to look away from. And I firmly believe that that contributes to the unwillingness of our legal system, um, a large, certainly a significant part of our legal system, uh, to be responsive to the urgency of what they are facing right now. And, and I wanted to add one other aspect of this. We've talked a lot about the issues of visitation, um, equally important within juvenile justice settings, of course, um, access to counsel, as Chris mentioned, all of these things have been disrupted, um, altered, modified uh, substantially as a consequence of COVID. The other thing that has also happened in juvenile correctional facilities is that um, the lack of imagination about how to manage public health risks like a pandemic also meant that especially early on in March, April, and May, facilities were just placing youth in solitary confinement. If someone was infected, if there was a concern about spread within the facility, the only tool that these administrators knew how to use was to simply isolate children. And we've seen this in the adult prison setting as well. 
of course, the consequences of solitary confinement for children <laughs> are so profound in terms of their overall development and emotional and psychological well-being and risks of not only acquiring traumatic experiences, sort of, but of course, exacerbating trauma. Um, again, you know, in sort of Buffy's comment, like nudging, not directing, um, the nudging has led to a reduction in the use of solitary confinement. But at the same time, um, you know, with this conversation we're having generally in the country about testing, how much testing should we be doing? Facilities are also reluctant. We saw this in Louisiana. We've seen this in other communities. Uh, we've seen it across Pennsylvania. There's not this willingness to simply utilize test the testing mechanism as a way of knowing what the risk of spread is within a facility so that you can, in fact, try to conduct life as normally as possible. Um, so there is, there is much that is wanting uh, in these systems. I think it mirrors to some degree, to Chris's point, what is happening in the larger community around us. And I'd certainly agree that the confluence of the pandemic and the racial unrest and injustice that happened simultaneously um, has really contributed, I think, to the, the, the dire, um, really emotional and psychological isolation uh, and, and trauma that I think our youth are, are suffering in these systems. Thanks, that was, that was a really, really, um very useful and moving um, discussion of, of the relationship between uh, between race and uh, and this pandemic. And you know, I think that the world understands that in the, that that COVID has shed a harsh light on on uh, the poor health services that that communities of color have and, but I think what 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 uh, you are saying and what we are what we are saying is is that it's also shedding a harsh light on on the juvenile justice and and child welfare system and sort of making evident the the very deep systemic problems that have long long existed. I want to have a few minutes at the end to talk about lessons we've learned, uh, and that's probably one of them that that we understand even better the the uh, uh, the sort of racist underpinnings of the operation of these these systems. But um, what other lessons have we? Um, uh, you know, have we learned about the response of these two systems to uh, to this pandemic? Um, so, um, Kristen, you want to start telling us what lessons we've learned and how it might either change uh, the way the systems operate in the future, or should we just get back to normal as quickly yeah. as possible? Or what? What's what is your take? So I think we've got to take inventory. I think there, um, there are some things that have been blessings in disguise and some things that we have had to do um, that were necessary uh, to accommodate, but that we should abandon as soon as we can. And so um, I'll start with the, um, maybe I'll start with the good. Um, I, I think, um, one is, I mean, where, where we started, which is this question of release from detention and release from facilities, right? We have proven, at least for the moment, that we can reduce the footprint of the juvenile legal system um, uh, on young people without drastically compromising public safety. Again, at least for the moment, we need to track the data and make sure that's, that's true. Um, I think we also have to be careful if the data comes back and shows that crime does go up, we have to ask ourselves, what should we have been doing differently in this moment? Um, the, the, uh, as Marsha talked about, the, the denial of services. You know, uh, are services in place? Can we ensure that services are in place as we continue to keep our population low? So that's one thing. Another benefit I hope we take from this moment is that we can use technology to our advantage. Here's one that's um, we haven't talked about and that's sort of out of the box, um, but access to counsel at interrogation. And you say, well, what in the world am I talking about? If we've demonstrated that we can use Zoom technology um, and other virtual technology to make counsel available um, in those places that have been able to make those accommodations, why can't we make um, that available at interrogation? 
at the front end of the system. Now, of course, I would prefer live in-person um, uh, uh, counsel um, at the time of interrogation of young people. Um, obviously, I would also prefer no interrogation at all of young people. But but the, the point is, is, is being, how can we use technology creatively? Um, I think that is one way that we can do so. Um, I think we can increase uh, contact using the new technology that we have um, in facilities to increase uh, contact more generally between young people um, and, and their families, uh, young people and lawyers. Um, a number of jurisdictions have suspended fines and fees um, in this moment because of the economic crisis tied to COVID. That should persist. Those kinds of things I think we can learn from. Um, one final benefit, and I'll uh, just uh, highlight a couple of harms. Um, we one, only have a couple more minutes, I think. Okay, great. Um, I'll just say this is that I think we are we, we use uh, ro routine uh, uh, conditions of probation right without being thoughtful and individualized um, and I think in this moment of, of COVID we have reduced uh, the number of conditions of probation in many instances not all um, and so that it shows that we don't need those let me just say a couple of things that I that we did that I don't want us to see us continue that is video arraignments and hearings um, the you know we had to adjust to accommodate, to move hearings forward, to get young people out of detention. So we have been doing virtual hearings and arraignments. Um, I don't want that to become the excuse for this is a business as usual once we, we get out. Um, and then I would just say the last thing is that we as defense counsel need to remember that we cannot get too comfortable um, with this new world of virtual contact with our clients and that we need to quickly return uh, to face-to-face -face contact um, home visits with our clients and the like. So, so Claire, what what lessons do you see from that we can take from this period? Yeah, well, I think we're going to get a lot more information, a lot more statistics, a lot more studies and outcomes <laughs> over time. I think it's going to be hard to disentangle what are the effects of what happened during this time. The simple fact that most children um, certainly we're not in in-person school and that we know that virtual school has really just been um, uh, horrific and really basically non-existent for many children and the devastating impact of that. So, for example, just to use that as one example, it's going to be hard to disentangle the effect of not being in school from all the other things that we'll, we'll see go on with children. Um, but one thing I think we are going to learn, and this is you know, a real problem now, but hopefully we'll, we'll pay dividends down the road is again, the importance of contact between parents and children. So because it's, we know what we need to do. We know, and in fact, just in February of 2020, before the pandemic, um, the Administration for, for Children and Families, a part of HHS that oversees the child welfare system, they issued something called an information memorandum that really doubled down on the importance of what they call family time, right? Not just visitation, but family time um, for parents and children in the, in the child welfare system and how that can reduce the trauma of being removed and help child outcomes and imp improve the parent-child relationship. All of these things, we know how critical that is. And now we're going through a period where it's not happening. And I think we're going to see really devastating impacts from that. And my hope is that that will lead all of us in this system um, to really uh, to, to double down on it once we are able to reinstitute, especially in-person um, visitation be between parents and children. So we'll see that as even more of a core aspect of, of the child welfare system. Uh, Marcia, lessons from the time of COVID? Um, I'll be I'll be quick. Uh, Chris said a lot <laughs> that I agree with. Um, so I'm just going to focus on the depopulation issues. Uh, it is true that the footprint of the juvenile justice system has shrunk. Uh, the numbers of kids in juvenile correctional facilities on any given day is substantially less today than it was in February. And at the same time, we are having a very serious conversation right now, not only about making things better, but about abolishing aspects of our justice system. And so I certainly hope that we will have an opportunity to examine uh, how it how it worked out that we were able to simply not bring children into the system. There are counties across the country, Luzerne County in Pennsylvania, Fulton County in Georgia, that simply stopped detaining children 100% or zero, whichever way you're looking at it. No youth were detained. Those communities did not fall apart. They did not have crime waves. That's what I'm interested in. And that's what I hope we can take some lessons from. Thank you. So 
this is this has been such such an important interesting conversation and and I thanks to all the panelists uh, the uh, it is you know I think it, you've given us a lot to think about so thank you thank you Buffy thank you thank you for tuning in to reasonably speaking visit ali.org to learn more about this important topic and our speakers don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode Reasonably Speaking is produced by the American Law Institute with audio engineering by Kathleen Morton and digital editing by Sarah Ferrero. Podcast episodes are moderated by Jennifer Marinigo and I'm Sean Kellum.